So let's just talk a little bit about tomography, right? Tomography really literally means slice imaging. Um, and really the idea here is we want to go from the planar x-rays uh, that were talked about here to these slice type images that were talked about, to what we were, we were uh, talking about when we talk about CT. You know, what were the limitations of those images back then? You know, I had a really poor quality x-ray tube, really poor quality film, no good collimation, scatter suppression, and all those things. So if you really look at the early history of x-ray imaging after 1895, a lot of it was devoted to kind of improving some of those things. But you know, even after that stuff was done, you still have the issue that on a planar radiograph, those 3D structures are all superimposed into a 2D image. So people really started to try and work on ways to minimize that effect. And this picture should look very familiar to you, right? Because I showed you a picture that looked like this when we talked about tomosynthesis. And right, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Because we were doing quote unquote tomosynthesis or conventional tomography going back 80 years ago. Basically, we rotated the x-ray tube and the film in concert with each other. And what you got was a single plane that was in better focus and the planes above and below that out of focus. Unlike today's digital technology, if I wanted a different depth of plane, I had to repeat the, po the process all over again using a slightly different fulcrum point. But what's nice with digital is we can do it one time and then just change the amount of shifting in the images when we add them together to get the different planes. So when I started residency back in 2001, 2002, we used to do a lot of intravenous pilograms, right? So we would take an image of the patient, we'd kind of guess how deep the kidneys were in the bottom, we'd do a tomogram, okay? You can think tomosynthesis uh, with a piece of film, and we'd look at that and say, yeah, the kidneys, were at about the depth of the kidneys there, go ahead and give them their contrast, and then we'd do our tomogram again to show that out. So these are some slice images, some conventional tomography type images that were done uh, before CT. How many people have a Panorex unit where they are? Another type of conventional tomography, right, where we rotate the x-ray tube and the imaging acquisition device together to get this image that has the plane of the mandible in good focus, the curved surface of that mandible, and the tissues deeper to that and superficial to that a little bit more out of focus. And of course, we also mentioned breast tomosynthesis. So those are types of kind of conventional tomography. In the early 60s, people started to think about, well, is, is there a way to do something better than to just, you know, have this limited arc and blur structures out? They're still there kind of in the way, even if they're blurred out a little bit better. And people really started to think about the mathematics of how to do that, how to reconstruct a cross-section of the image. And I want to introduce you to the concept of simple back projection, which was the first idea to do that. So imagine you have a, a round object, like a, let's say a cylinder, and you do a projection of that. So here's that projection, you know, it's like a, a line in an x-ray, if, if you will. And notice it's brighter in the center because the x-rays had to travel through a little bit thicker material and therefore were more attenuated and decreased on the edges. Well, now imagine if you took the projection image of that, the x-ray image of that, in this direction, and you also took it in this direction. Well, if I wanted to reconstruct a slice through that object, why don't I take this profile that I got here, remember, which is a little brighter in the center and drops off at the edges, and smear that back along the direction the x-ray was obtained. And then I'll do that for this projection as well. And we get some picture that looks like this. It doesn't really look anything like the original object, but, but let's take four projections. Now, instead of getting one to a pair 90 degrees apart, let's get one at uh, 45 degrees and then one over here at 135 degrees. And let's do that simple smearing back along the direction in which that occurred. Again, not looking a whole lot like the original object, but a little bit more so. And if we do that for more and more projections, notice when we get up to 32 or so projections here, 
we're starting to get something that looks a lot like that original object. Unfortunately, it still has this blurring in the background that decreases the contrast in this slice image here. This is the notion of simple back projection. I want to apply it to a couple of objects so you get a better idea, something that's a little bit more complicated than that simple little round object that I showed you. Here's a mathematical phantom that's sometimes used to represent the brain. So imagine if we're taking a projection in this direction, right? And then that's the line of data that's represented here. And you'll notice this goes from zero to 180 degrees with one degree increment. So those are the, each line is the projection that you would take at each one of those degree increments. So here's the zero projection in that direction. When you get out here to where it's 90 degrees, that's the projection that's obtained in that direction. Now if you take each of those lines and you smear them back across a slice, right, smear them back, you get something that looks like that. Again, it looks like a very blurred version of that Shep Logan phantom. And that's the simple back projection. And again, the main problem with the simple back projection is that decrease in the contrast because of the fact that when we smear this back along the entire direction, it actually ends up putting stuff out here in the background where there's absolutely nothing in, in, the, in the true representation of the object. So how, how do we correct for that, right? Simple back projection basically produces a blurred image, a blurred slice image of the true object. And if we can understand the mathematical process behind the blurring, right, if we, we can correct for the blurring, and that's exactly what filtering does. Filtering is the correction that's applied so that when you do the back projection, the image turns out looking correct. So filtered back projection. We filter those projections and then we do the same thing. We just do that back projection of them uh, like we do. So let's look at that. So remember, here was that simple back projection. We had that original object that looked a little blurry. It turns out that the filtering means that we multiply this guy times, um, its, or at least its frequency don represent, domo, domain representation, and I won't get into that, but by this thing called a filter. And it changes the way that that object looks. Here's what the profile through that object looked like originally, right? We talked about the fact that it was most dense, if you will, in this region, so that's the highest peak, and then dropped off towards the edges. When you multiply that by the filter or apply the filter, convolve it with its filter if you want to be more mathematically correct, it ends up looking like this. Notice these negative side lobes on the edge of the object. That ends up canceling out that background stuff that we had that we knew shouldn't be there, okay? So that's, that's the object of that. So here is the filtered back projection with two projections. And if you notice with two projections, you probably would say to yourself, this sucks worse than the simple back projection, right? And it's really not until you get up to 64 projections or so that you notice you get a much sharper version of your original object, but it, it is in the background of a little bit of kind of uh, reconstruction noise. If you took this out to 128, 256, the mathematics behind the filtered back projection actually assumes that there, if you will, there is an infinite number of these projections to do that. So there's a little bit of artifact from that. So compare the filtered back projection to that simple back projected object. So that's what I want you to understand in terms of conceptually happening. That data that the CT scan acquires, those are the projections. And then we're going to take those and we're going to mathematically apply this filtering to them and then do the back projection. And that's going to give us our reconstruction for filtered back projection. Here's that Shep Logan phantom. Here's that, those projections, it's a, something called the sinogram, and here's that simple back projected object, and here's the filtered back projection version of that. And there's actually a couple here, because it turns out you can actually do filtering of the projections and then back project, so that's filtered back projection. But if you want, you can back project first and then filter, so you can do back projection filtering, but that typically isn't what's done, and it's just showing two examples of those. I wanted to give you a a real, little bit more of a real world example, right? So here is an original CT slice. So now if we 
theoretically were to take that and make our projection data and do a simple back projection of that, that's what the object would look like, right? You can tell maybe it's a slice of the body and you can see the vert vertebral body and some of the ribs there, but not much. And here it is, the filtered back projection image from that. And you can tell this was, must have been a, um, you know, a uh, mathematician or a physicist or someone who did this, right? Because they didn't care how they displayed the image. This patient's uh, got their spine, right, uh, anteriorly there. But it just conceptually gives you the idea between what simple back projection and filtered back projection are. Now, we're moving more and more to iterative reconstruction techniques away from filtered back projection. And the main reason for that is we can actually model the image formation process a little bit better and therefore do a little bit better handling of noise and those kind of things. And you may ask, well, why didn't we do that before, you know, the last five years or so? And the reason is that's computationally an extremely complex problem. Um, it, is, it takes a tremendous amount of computing power. The theoretic mathematics behind it aren't as complex as they are for filtered back projection, but the computational power that you need in terms of a computer to perform this are much more, uh, you need much more computational power. So I want you to think of your image as just being an array of, of values in a grid here. And of course the grid is much finer than I've even described here, 512 by 512 typically in CT. But in some ways, we can really think of this as a problem of, you know, multiple equations with unknowns, and we just need to solve those multiple equations. And I want to show you just briefly what I mean by that by doing our little four pixel example here, right? It's not going to be a very interesting problem with four pixels, but I think conceptually it will give you an idea, right? What do we do? We shine radiation of a known value across our object, which here I've drawn consisting of four pixels. We're only going to solve for it in terms of four pixels. And the amount of radiation that's going to pass through these two pixels and then hit our detector so I can measure the amount of uh, radiation that's incident on the detector. So I know how much was here and I know how much was there. I also know how wide these pixels are. And by the way, I could do a similar thing here. Incident radiation, which is probably the same as that amount, but the amount I detect may be a little different because these attenuation values here in this second row may be slightly different. So let's write an equation just for this top x-ray beam coming through and we detect it. So the amount that I detect is equal to the amount that comes in initially times e to the minus the thickness of the pixels and then those linear attenuation values, right? Remember, we talked about the fact that the X-ray beam intensity decays exponentially and the decay constants are the linear attenuation values. And these are the things that I want to plot. I want to make a picture of mu11 and mu12. So if you just take the log of both sides of those, I can now convert that to the log of these two values. That's just a number, right? Because we know both of those quantities. And that equals this guy in terms of our two unknowns. So I'm gonna change this. I know this looks a little messy here, right? So let's just call that some constant because it's really a value that we can calculate knowing the intensity going in and the intensity detected. So all I have is that C11 equals these two things. Well, I've got a known value here, and it equals the sum of those two unknown quantities. Right? Does everyone see that I could write a very similar equation for here? Right? I could write a very similar equation here. And then if I wanted to, so there's that other equation. If I wanted to, I could then rotate you know, 90 degrees and do the same exact thing again and get another equation here and another equation here. And very simply, right, I have four equations, four linear equations in four unknowns. And we all remember back to our algebra class where we had two equations and two unknowns and we had to solve them and we thought that that sucked. And then our teacher asked us to do three equations and three unknowns and we thought that sucked a lot more. And then they maybe taught us Kramer's rule or something to use matrices to try and sim simplify that. But, but um, you know, so this is a system of linear equations and unknowns. I mean, what's so hard about that? Yes, if you did it by hand, it's hard, but just put a, a computer to work on that. Each 512 by 512 CT slice contains 262,144 unknowns, okay? 
Modern CT scanners acquire approximately a thousand projections, right? Not just the two that I talked about to find our four unknowns, right? A thousand projections. And there's about 750 detectors in a single row on the CT scanner, right? So I've got a thousand times 750. That's 750,000 equations. Fortunately, I have more equations than unknowns, right? So, so I can solve that problem. But because of noise, those equations aren't even consistent with each other, right? So this is a tremendously challenging pro problem in terms of reconstruction, in terms of the computational power it takes. So what does iterative reconstruction do? It doesn't quite do exactly what we just talked about by solving those as a system of unknowns. Instead, it kind of says, well, what should the image look like? Let me use a guess to do that. Some, sometimes it actually uses something like filtered back projection as its initial guess. And it says, well, then let me take that guess of what the image should look like and let me compute what its projections would look like. What would the data on the detectors of the CT scanner look like if that was what the, Im the object looked like? And then it can compare those to the projection data that you got and look for what the difference is between those. And it can then use that difference to correct your estimation of the object. So basically, I went through all of this, but what I'm really saying is it says, well, let me start off with a guess of the image, and then I'm gonna calculate a correction factor, and I'm gonna correct that guess to give me a new image. And then I'll repeat this process. Well, how much does my new image match with the projection data. And if it doesn't, I'll cal calculate a correction factor and I'll update that image. And I'll continue to do this until my difference between my estimated projections from my image and the projections we measured is below some certain level. Okay, that's iterative reconstruction. Unfortunately, there's many variables that must be chosen as part of an iterative reconstruction. You know, how do we calculate that correction factor I kind of glossed over? When do you stop? How many iterations do you do before you stop? How do you use those projections to update the data? A lot of those things. And because of that, um, there are a lot of iterative reconstruction algorithms out there. You know, every manufacturer's filtered back projection algorithm basically does the same thing that, that I talked about. You can use slightly different filters, but their algorithm does the same thing. The iteratives are much more variable, so they're a little harder to talk about. We first used iterative reconstruction in nuclear medicine. Here, here's a, um, a cardiac study where really everything opened up so you can see the entire uh, uh, chest. Um, in this uh, woman, um, but here's the number of iterations. One iteration, two, five, 10, 15, 20, 50, 100, 150. And you can see that as you continue to iterate, the data tends to get noisier and noisier. You tend to amplify noise as you iterate more and more. So you've got to know, you know, how do you pick your stopping point for this iteration process this is another important question as well. And oftentimes I'll ask people when I show this, you know, tell me, hey, which one of these images do you think is the best? And there'll be, there'll be quite a bit of variation. You know, some people will say we should stop at 10. Other people will say we should stop at 20. But people usually mostly pick something that's in that middle row, though. So I said, told you that this is computationally much more demanding than filtered back projection. So then why are we using it? Well, because it has some certain advantages, right? It allows us to better model the physics of the projection back projection process. It allows us to better handle noise. Um, we can model some of the blurring uh, in the detector, uh, some of the resolution blurring there. Uh, we can better model the physics of that projector and back projector, and we can better handle some of the processes that actually occur, but filtered back projection assumes don't occur, like beam hardening and photon starvation and those kind of things. So iterative reconstruction, here to stay. How many people in the room are using iterative reconstruction as part of their, uh, they've got switched away from filtered back projection and all their body CTs are now being reconstructed iter iteratively. So we've got a, a few hands in the audience. My guess is if I ask that next year and the subsequent year, those percentages of hands are just gonna continue to go up. <laughs> 
So we did a little brief historical introduction to tomography and its use in medical imaging. Um, I wanted to introduce for you so that you have kind of just a, a feeling for what simple back projection is and of course what filtered back projection is on top of that. And then kind of a, an idea of what iterative reconstruction is on top of that.